Welcome back. Today we'll discuss some of the properties of blood flow that are particular to veins and the microcirculation. Compared with the arteries, veins are similar in size but have a lower ratio of wall thickness to radius and as a result are more distensible. They often have valves or varicosities and they contain about 80% of the blood volume in the body at rest. This is the reason that the veins are often referred to as the capacitance vessels. Blood pressure in the veins is much lower than in the arteries and therefore they are much more sensitive to changes in the external pressures and also to the effects of body forces on the pressure gradients. Veins can collapse under negative pressures if the pressure difference between the inside and the outside of the vessel is greater than zero, then the vein is open or patent. If it's less than zero, then the vein may collapse. If it's greater than zero at the entry, but less than zero at the exit, then you can get flow limitation or flutter. If the pressure on the outside of the vein exceeds the pressure on the inside, then the vein can buckle. It's possible to do an engineering analysis of a thin, unsupported elastic cylinder. And although we won't derive it, the critical buckling pressure depends on the flexural or bending rigidity of the tube cross-section. That critical buckling pressure has been found to be minus 3 E prime I over R cubed, where the EI term here is familiar with the bending rigidity of a beam, except that E prime is not E, it's E over 1 minus nu squared, where nu is the Poisson ratio. And for a thin-walled tube, the area moment of inertia I is H cubed over 12, where H is the wall thickness of the tube. Here we see a graph of pressure versus cross-sectional area in a collapsible tube where the pressure variable P tilde has been normalized and the cross-sectional area variable alpha has also been normalized such that P tilde is the difference between the pressure inside the vessel and the external pressure Px divided by Kp where Kp is E prime I over R cubed, or E H cubed over 12, 1 minus nu squared times R cubed, which we'll see from this result up here, is minus the critical buckling pressure divided by 3. And alpha, the normalized area variable, is the cross-sectional area of the vessel divided by pi R naught squared, where R naught is the radius of the vessel at zero transmural pressure. So you can see these experimental data shown in the solid line show that as the pressure inside the vessel falls below the pressure outside the vessel, the cross-sectional area falls dramatically as the vein starts to buckle. And you can see that the, the critical buckling pressure on the normalized scale will be P tilde of minus three. So right about here. Now in contrast to some veins like the vena cava, other veins are more stable at negative pressures, such as the pulmonary veins, and this is because they are surrounded by tissue that provides support. Recall that in the wave equation, the wave speed c was proportional to the square root of the vessel distensibility, dpda, or in this case, more correctly, dp minus p external da. Therefore, as p approaches p external and the vein becomes unstable, the distensibility and thus the wave speed become lower and lower on that flat part of the curve in the previous slide. That allows the possibility that the point can be reached where the flow velocity actually reaches the wave speed and we get a flow limitation phenomenon whereby increasing pressure actually decreases flow. 
This is analogous to a shock wave in a pressure wave propagation or a hydraulic jump in a shallow water wave situation. So the unusual behaviors that occur when the flow velocity exceeds the wave speed and that occur in uh, shock waves and hydraulic jump also apply in collapsible vessel flows. In the same way that we have a Mach number for the ratio of the speed to the speed of sound, that for the wave speed of pulse wave propagation in the veins, uh, S equals U over C, where the flow velocity divided by the pulse wave propagation velocity is called the Shapiro number or speed index. This link is to an article that describes the history of the speed index and actually proposes that it be called the Shapiro number. Now let's consider some special features of blood flow in the microcirculation. The microcirculation includes the capillaries and blood vessels that are below about 100 microns in diameter. The Reynolds and Wormersley numbers are much, much less than one in the microcirculation because both the diameters and the velocities are small and therefore viscous forces are highly dominant and inertial forces can be neglected. The microcirculation is important for circulatory mass transport functions and Starling's hypothesis that you learn about in mass transport governs the mass transport. Capillaries consist of only endothelial cells and capillary permeability is a function of the endothelial gap junctions, some of which are tight, others are fenestrated or discontinuous. Lymphatic vessels carry interstitial fluid between arterial and venous circulations. They are porous and have valves. Therefore, conservation of mass in the microcirculation needs to consider the mass transport not only along the capillaries, but from the capillaries to the interstitium and the lymphatics. Capillary diameter is actually smaller than red blood cell diameter in the smallest capillaries. And hence, at this scale, blood becomes inhomogeneous. The size of the red blood cells relative to the scale of interest is large. Microvascular flow is not necessarily steady, although it's often modeled as such because the inertial forces are very low, but the effect of the pulse wave can be observed in microvascular flows. Some interesting characteristics of microvascular flows include the observation by Ferreus in 1929 that the hematocrit measured in a thin tube is different from the bulk red blood cell fraction of the reservoir supplying the blood to the thin tube. Another unusual phenomenon described by Ferreus and Lindquist in 1931 describes the effect of tube diameter at small scales on the apparent viscosity. It actually goes down as the tube diameter decreases, at least to a point. Turns out this second observation, the Ferreus-Lindquist effect, can be explained by the first one, the Ferreus effect, and its effect of tube diameter on hematocrit and the effect of hematocrit on whole blood viscosity. So let's take a look at exactly what these phenomena are. So let's start with the Ferreus-Lindquist effect. These are experimental data showing that as the radius of the tube falls below about 500 microns, the apparent viscosity of blood flow in the tube actually decreases. So you'll observe that for the smallest tubes in these experiments, down around uh, 20 microns in diameter or so, the viscosity is only two thirds of that in a one millimeter tube. It turns out that this observation is explained by the original observation that Ferreus made in 1929 of the effect of tube diameter on the relative hematocrit. So the relative hematocrit here is the ratio of the hematocrit measured in, of blood flowing in the thin tube divided by the hematocrit of the blood in the reservoir that supplied the tube. 
So you can see that for a 221 micron tube, in fact, the hematocrit, the red blood cell fraction in a 221 micron tube, is actually slightly lower than the hematocrit in the reservoir of blood that was supplying the tube. And that that ratio wasn't really dependent on the hematocrit in the reservoir, varying here between 15 and 60. But then as the tube gets narrower, you can see that the tube hematocrit relative to the reservoir hematocrit gets lower. Now it's only 90% at 154 microns, down to nearly 80% at 99 microns, and 75% at 59 microns. And then in a 29 micron diameter tube, you can see that the tube hematocrit, the hematocrit that you would measure by taking a snapshot of the flowing blood in the tube, varies somewhat with the feed reservoir hematocrit, but is somewhere around about 60%. So in other words, if the hematocrit in the reservoir was 40%, then the hematocrit of that same blood flowing through a 30 micron tube would only be about 24%. So it turns out that this observation explains the Ferreus Lindquist effect because the viscosity of blood depends on the hematocrit of whole blood. If the hematocrit of blood flowing in a small tube is less than the hematocrit of blood going into the tube, then the apparent viscosity would be lower. So the Ferreus effect explains the Ferreus Lindquist effect. But the real question is, what explains the Ferreus effect? Can you think why the hematocrit in the thin tube would be less than the hematocrit in the reservoir that's supplying the tube? And in case you're thinking that perhaps all the red blood cells in the reservoir don't make it into the tube, I can also tell you that the collecting reservoir that collects the blood after it's flowed through the thin tube also has the same hematocrit as the feed reservoir. So it's not that the red blood cells somehow aren't making it into the tube. Can you explain this phenomenon? So the answer to this question must be that the average velocity of the red blood cells must be greater than the average velocity of the plasma so that in taking a snapshot of red blood cells flowing through the thin tubes, they spend less time in the tube than the plasma on average, and therefore the fraction of red blood cells in the tube is less than the fraction of red blood cells going into the tube and leaving the tube. So then the question is, why does that happen? Why, as tube diameter decreases from 200 or 300 microns down to 30 microns, does the red blood cell average velocity get faster than the plasma average velocity? Well, the answer is that the red blood cells tend to flow down the middle of the tube. Once the tubes get smaller, the average concentration of red blood cells must be higher near the middle of the tube than the wall because the red blood cells can't cross the wall. So therefore, their average concentration gets higher near the middle of the flow where the flow velocity is higher. So therefore, the average flow velocity of the red blood cell is actually higher than the average plasma flow velocity. Now, it's worth appreciating that this phenomenon doesn't continue indefinitely. Down at the scale of 5 or 10 microns, there's an, actually an inversion of the ferreus lindquist effect, and the apparent viscosity can go back up. So today we've just discussed a few qualitative interesting features of blood flow in the veins and microcirculation. And next time we will uh, derive some equations that are useful for analyzing creeping flows of the kind that occur in the microcirculation.